Uh, well, it will surprise absolutely none of you <laughs> to hear that I'm going to be talking about genetics. Um, it's not the only thing I'm going to be talking about, though. Uh, the other thing I'm going to be talking about is denial. Uh, more broadly, I'd like to talk about uh, what happens when very mainstream and well-established research comes under some attack from people who speak the language of science but actually don't espouse all of its principles. Um, and as you can see, most of you guys were funny and entertaining, and the predominant emotion I'll be channeling is uh, righteous anger. Sorry. Sorry? I was angry about the I, I kind of want one of the mushrooms, actually. Um, so I'm, a, I'm not a native speaker of science myself. Uh, I don't have a degree in genetics. Uh, I think of myself a bit as a, a traveler in a foreign country. Um, on the other hand, I am an absolutely enormous geek. And uh, I've just finished taking these four classes. And uh, I've been embedded in those three labs. Uh, and all of those labs are dedicated to the genetics of uh, complex traits in humans. So uh, I've also gone to quite a lot of conferences this semester. And uh, most of them have been aimed at understanding DNA and its relationship to disease in humans, uh, especially the diseases that most people worried about, cancer and heart attacks and diabetes and obesity, the big ones. Um, having spent all this time around the field, I'm fairly sure I would have noticed if it was having a, an existential crisis. Uh, when you're in a foreign country, you, you tend to notice if the infrastructure is falling apart. Uh, so you can imagine I was a, a little surprised last week to see a report uh, claiming that genes play absolutely no role in common disease. Uh, the authors quote a lot of scientific literature to make their point, uh, and they say that all of this research over the last 10 years actually suggests that genes don't matter. Um, if this is true, then my whole semester, and more importantly, an entire decade of biomedical research has been a giant waste of time. Uh, so is it true? Well, this is the report. Um, it's by a group called the Bioscience Resource Project, and you can see the, uh, the conclusions for yourself here. Uh, genetic susceptibility is not a major factor determining the health of human populations. Uh, the report actually goes on to list some of the things that genes are apparently not a factor in. These would include heart disease, cancer, stroke, autoimmune diseases, obesity, autism, Parkinson's disease, depression, schizophrenia, and so on. Uh, this contradicts, of course, what most of us have been taught, and I apologize for the poor quality image, but I thought this was a great sort of way of putting it. Uh, what we've been taught, mostly, is that nature and nurture are both important. Uh, as the saying goes, genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. And uh, we actually hear a lot about the perils of genetic determinism. So assuming that your genes are your fate, that they, they make you who you are. Uh, this is clearly a wrong idea, as any geneticist will tell you. Uh, so when I first read the report, I thought, you know, this sounds a lot like environmental determinism. Uh, this idea that your environment alone decides your fate and makes you who you are that you are somehow the, the sum total of things that are done to you. And so since that sounds so ridiculous to me, uh, naturally, my first inclination was to fire my mouth off on Twitter. Um, <laughs> in retrospect, it occurred to me that uh, the authors of this report do have PhDs, and I don't, and they're smart people. So maybe I should be taking them a little more seriously. I wonder if that is also what was going through Michael Pollan's mind a few days later, uh, because he posted his own appraisal of the report on Twitter. And here's what he had to say. The, de the uh, gene disease paradigm is collapsing. Why aren't we hearing more about this? Michael Pollan's a very smart guy. And uh, predictably, this got a lot of traction on Twitter and then on the Huffington Post. Um, I'd like to spend the next few minutes arguing uh, that, obviously, the gene disease paradigm is not collapsing. And uh, yet, this is something we have been hearing a lot about over the last year. So let's back up for a minute. How do scientists study the gene disease paradigm uh, with respect to common diseases? And don't worry, you don't actually have to understand anything up there. Uh, the major tool that they use is something called a genome-wide association study, or GWAS. And the studies are actually pretty simple. Uh, you get one group of people who have a disease. You get another group of people who don't have that disease. You compare some tiny variants in their DNA. Uh, you see if some of those variants are more common in the sick people. Very basic. Uh, sometimes those variants are in the protein-making parts of the genome. Uh, more often, they're actually in regions that do other things, uh, like regulating other genes. Uh, but either way, the variants do turn up. They're in there. Uh, for instance, uh, one that might interest Michael Pollan is called FTO. Uh, people who are obese are much more likely than uh, people of average weight to have this particular variant in FTO. Uh, you can flip that around, and it's still true. Uh, people who have FTO are more likely to be, or more likely to, uh, to weigh more than those don't. 
Uh, this is an association that was found in 2007, and it's been replicated 14 times since then. Um, we don't actually know what FTO does, per se, uh, but recently, uh, as Hanna will tell you, because he's presented this paper to a class, uh, some scientists engineered a mouse model that had some extra copies of the gene. Uh, and they found that, I believe this is right, mice with more copies of FTO, uh, and they are the mice in the purple line up there at the top, uh, they tend to eat more, and they are heavier. Uh, now, this is just one gene implicated in a disease that's obviously influenced by many other genes and also has some serious environmental factors, such as Twinkies. So uh, maybe not a terribly good snapshot of what human genetics has looked like over the last 10 years. This, however, is a pretty good snapshot. Uh, hundreds of other associations have been made over the last few years. Uh, this is a diagram of all 23 human chromosomes, and uh, each colored dot represents a link between a genetic variant and a common disease or trait. Uh, all of these have passed an extremely rigorous test of statistical significance. The p-value here is 0 0.00005. Was that seven zeros? Um, and the chart's a little outdated. Uh, yesterday, uh, Eric Lander came to speak to my med school class, and he says that there are 1,100 variants uh, that have been mapped to complex traits at this point. There is something the chart's not telling you. Uh, it's actually a pretty key point for understanding what's in this report. Uh, so these genome-wide association studies are only looking at common variants in the genome. Um, these are variants that show up in more than 1% of the population. Uh, that's what these studies are statistically powered to do. And the rub is, so far, uh, all of these common variants have really not explained a whole lot of the heritability of common diseases. So I'll give you something much nicer to look at now. Um, I just said that uh, GWAS haven't been able to explain a lot of the heritability. Well, what, what is heritability? Uh, well, for years, scientists have been able to estimate um, how much any disease or trait might be influenced by genes, as opposed to environment, uh, by looking at twins. Uh, so for instance, twin studies might tell you that 80% of the variation in height uh, that you see in a population is determined by genes. Uh, that 80% is the heritability. The problem is that most common genes discovered by GWAS uh, have individually very small effects on a person's phenotype. So a recent GWAS found 180 genes uh, that influence height, uh, but those genes added together only explain about 10% of the heritability. Uh, this is a pattern we see across the board with common diseases, and what it means is that common disease is not caused by common genes with strong effects. The human genome just doesn't turn out to be built that way. And this is something we've been hearing a lot about. Uh, if you read any of these particular postmortems on the uh, Human Genome Project, because uh, we've just had the 10th anniversary, uh, you've probably noticed uh, a meme that genomics has been disappointing uh, because it showed us that the genome is very complex. Uh, there is a lot we don't understand yet, and that is one way to look at this issue of what they call missing heritability. Uh, but none of these articles have gone so far as to claim that this means there are no genes involved in common disease. Uh, remember, this is what the authors of this report are saying. So there are several ways you can pick apart this argument. You can look at other fields. Uh, so I think this is kind of a fun way of doing it. Uh, if you look at dog genomics, or even just dog breeds, you don't even need to look at genomics. Um, Dalmatians are prone to deafness, uh, but they don't go to rock concerts. They're clearly not losing their hearing that way. There must be some genes involved. Um, the other entry up there on the left, or my left, uh, points out that a lot of epidemiological studies have enormous holes in them. Um, these are things that you see with environmental factors, but that doesn't mean the environment per se doesn't matter. It just means that the studies, there's something going on with the studies. You can also take the argument apart uh, piece by piece and point out all the technical flaws. Um, one of my favorite uh, geneticists slash writers has done this, so I won't bore you all with it, but we'll go through very, very briefly what the problem is. Uh, the report says that common genes don't cause common disease, but there's a lot of other things in the genome. Uh, so some of the theories uh, about what else might be the genetic causes of these diseases, uh, rare variants that you can't find with GWAS, uh, slightly less common variants that you can find with an enormous GWAS, you know, several hundred thousand people even. Uh, and as GWAS have been getting bigger, you are starting to find more of these. We can now explain about 60% of the uh, heritability in type 1 diabetes. Um, what else do we have? Copy number variants, which uh, that's sort of like the mice with many copies of FTO. Um, you uh, couldn't really even detect these with microarrays until very recently. Um, Gene-gene interaction, gene-environment interaction, um, it's sort of statistically hard to, uh, to detect those things, and people are just starting to figure that out. Um, and I would put epigenetics in that category, uh, because epigenetics is just environmental forces acting on genes. 
Um, and all of this is different than saying that maybe the twin studies got heritability wrong and overestimated it. Now that's what these authors of this report have as their, their sort of trump card. They say, oh, the twin studies were wrong. Um, they've actually made an error of their own. Uh, they appear to have misunderstood that the way heritability is calculated. And I won't take you through that, but if you want an explanation of why, the, uh, the blog with the shirtless guys, that's, that's the place to go. Now finally, maybe all this discussion about missing heritability is, is beside the point. Um, I think there's a pretty strong argument. Um, sometimes common genes with weak effects are quite medically relevant. Uh, the best example is a gene that makes um, HMG-CoA reductase. It's a protein that's involved in making cholesterol. Uh, and there's a common variant in this gene that doesn't really predict anything much about someone's uh, likelihood of having high LDL cholesterol. Uh, but you may have heard of HMG-CoA reductase. Uh, it's the target of the statins. These are the best-selling drugs in the world. So in some ways, the heritability may be a little bit of a distraction from the point of medical genetics. But all of this is a bit in the weeds. Uh, you wouldn't expect a layperson to engage in this kind of debate, I don't think. So is there something that, as a journalist, uh, that we can say that will make people understand what this debate is about? Uh, I think there is. The fact is that the, uh, the authors of this report have made two rather critical philosophical errors. And you don't need to know anything about biology to understand these. This is the first one. Absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's an obvious logical fallacy. The report looks at a technique that is limited, and then it says, oh, well, that technique didn't work. Therefore, you know, nothing will work. There aren't any genes. The second problem is that they assume that science is a monologue. The report does actually go through some of those potential hiding places for heritability, rare variants and gene gene interaction, that sort of thing. But it actually knocks them all down because it says, oh, well, here's one or two papers that, that disagree with this. Uh, scientists have not come to a consensus that one of those things is mostly responsible. And this is really quite silly. Uh, there's reason, or there's no reason to expect that one of those candidates would explain everything. Uh, in fact, I don't think anyone would expect that. It might be that all of those play some role. Uh, the other thing is that science doesn't really work by consensus when it's this cutting edge. Uh, it's way too early to expect a consensus on this. We don't even have the data yet. Now, the authors of this uh, report I'm sure know that that's how science works because they have PhDs. Uh, so why are they saying what they're saying? Well, I didn't tell you who they were. Uh, they're an advocacy group. They work against big agriculture, which is laudable. And uh, you can see from this comment that one of them left on the Huffington Post that they actually believe the environment must be the entire cause of ill health. I will guarantee you they believe that before they sat down and did their analysis. It would be very, very convenient if human genetic research served their purpose. And again, their purpose is laudable. And I think they know that everybody likes to hear about environmental factors being quite powerful um, because environmental factors can be changed and genes can't. But that's about philosophy and politics and beliefs. You can choose what you think about big agriculture and whether you think it should be allowed to pollute. You can choose how you feel about your own genes and your own environment and how you want to live your life if you want to maximize what you're getting out of both of them. You can choose whether you believe specific scientific findings and you should be thinking that way. Uh, many studies are very poorly designed, they're incapable of pro proving what they claim to prove. But you don't really get to choose whether or not science is correct. Not science as a process. Uh, not the findings after they've been rigorously tested, not after they've been shown to be true over a very wide range of studies. You can incorporate them into your belief system, but you don't get to apply your belief system and then say that the findings are something other than what they are. That's denialism. It's what we see with climate change, it's what we see with vaccines, vaccines and autism, it's what we see with creationism, and it's something we've seen before with genetics. Now, I want to be really, really clear, I'm not calling anyone a eugenicist. Uh, least of all the Bioscience Resource Project, which is about as opposite of that as you can get, since they don't believe genes matter. But I do want to make a final point. Uh, in the early part of the last century, there was a huge explosion of data describing what was essentially genetic variation. Um, a good bit of that was actually research in humans. And regression analysis was invented to deal with this. It was actually invented to understand variations in height. Um, taken together, what all of that data showed was that inheritance was very complicated. And there were tremendous debates within the scientific community about how it worked. And then a group of very well-educated American progressives took this research while it was still in progress. And they took a side, and they ignored a lot of the data. And they tried to interpret it and apply it for a political reason. Uh, this is what they wound up with. If that's not an argument for respecting science instead of trying to abuse it for your own ideological purposes, I really don't know what it is. And that's actually all I have to say, but um, I'm happy to I answer questions. Question. Sure, sure. 